Queen Mary I, known to so many around the world by an unfortunate and frankly undeserving sobriquet, Bloody Mary, was the very first woman in English history to successfully ascend to the throne. Yes, there had been Empress Matilda and there had been Lady Jane Grey, but neither had managed to actually go through the process of a coronation. She was undoubtedly our first crowned Queen Regnant. And yet her successes as a queen, and indeed her entire persona, is invariably viewed as inherently evil. This image has undoubtedly been exacerbated by the depictions of Queen Mary in film and television. Since the earliest productions depicting the lives of the Tudors, Mary has often been consigned to the fringes wedged as she is, alongside her brother, between a father and a half-sister whose reigns were considerably longer and more momentous. As such, Mary is given mere minutes of screen time allotted to her, despite the extraordinary life that she led. Even so, much of what we do see of Mary is a vast array of lazy tropes. She is portrayed as an unhinged zealot, someone foolish, unattractive, with a husband she plainly adores but who clearly does not reciprocate those feelings. Her court is viewed as dark, evil and twisted, one of terror and suspicion. But does this actually portray Mary accurately? And if not, why is Mary so perpetually portrayed in such a negative light? And could this image be beginning to be viewed differently, thanks to the more recent representations of Mary, which feel much more well-rounded, such as Showtime's The Tudors, and in particular in the Stars series Becoming Elizabeth, which frankly, I believe, should have been called Becoming Mary, for the incredible job it does at rehabilitating Mary's reputation. In this episode, I will break down the key depictions of Mary on screen, assess their merit, authenticity, and determine which feels the most plausibly fair to this much maligned queen. Welcome back to the Tudor Chest, the podcast, episode 2, Queen Mary I on screen, victim or villain. Before I dive into the explorations of Queen Mary I on screen, I will do a quick reminder of her story. Mary was the first child of King Henry VIII to reach adulthood. Her mother was Catherine of Aragon, the king's first wife, making Mary half Spanish by birth. Although her parents, particularly her mother, doted on their only daughter, Mary's sex was viewed as disastrous by her father. Even so, Mary was raised a princess with a very grand household of around 300 people, headed up by Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, as Mary's governess. And for the first few years of her life, she led an almost idyllic existence. She was, however, frail, slight and small, with a poor constitution and what seems to have been highly irregular menstrual cycles, something that would dog Mary throughout her life. The fact that no sons were born to Catherine of Aragon eventually led to the breakdown of the royal marriage, with the appearance of Anne Boleyn on the scene as a major contributing factor. When her father made his intentions known and the marriage with Anne Boleyn eventually took place, Mary was deemed illegitimate, she lost her princess title, and had to defer to the daughter of Anne Boleyn, her half-sister Elizabeth, as heir apparent. The trauma of being separated from her mother and the emotional toll it created likely changed Mary beyond recognition. Although always devout, she became highly dogmatic in her approach to the Catholic faith, deploring the idea of religious reform. Mary's life improved enormously following the execution of Anne Boleyn and the rise of her second stepmother, Jane Seymour, which also saw her return to court and her father's side, but she would never regain her princess title and remained Lady Mary throughout the rest of her father's reign and that of her half-brother, Edward. What is interesting about much of Mary's early life is how entirely beloved she was by the common English people. Many deemed her as the king's true daughter, 
and would have welcomed her to the throne had Prince Edward not come along when he did. After her father's death, obviously Edward became king, but he died aged just 15, and after a short-lived coup which placed Lady Jane Grey on the throne, Mary finally achieved what many viewed as her birthright, and was proclaimed Queen of England in July 1553. She was, however, by now 37 years old, which was older than middle age by the standards of the time. Mary knew that if she had any hope of producing a legitimate and crucially Catholic heir to succeed her, that marriage would need to be one of her first orders of business. Thus, she duly married Prince Philip of Spain, despite the unease with which her council and the commons felt, concerned as they were that England would be enveloped into the wider powers of the Spanish Empire. Something else that Mary soon put into place was a full restoration of Catholicism in England, unity with the church in Rome, and the resurrection of the old heresy laws. The problem Mary faced, though, was although she held personal popularity, her actions did not. Many of her English subjects had grown used to the idea of religious reform. Indeed, her brother had been as equally Protestant as Mary was Catholic, and so although she still adhered to what she called the true faith, many of her countrymen and women did not, which would lead to the start of the Marian persecutions. These persecutions resulted in Queen Mary I committing nearly 300 people to the flames during her five-year reign. Obviously, this would leave a deep and understandable stain on her memory. However, it should also be taken into consideration that Mary was acting in accordance with the accepted beliefs of the day. And indeed, her brother, father, and later her sister all sent people to their deaths for their religious beliefs. The difference, however, in the way that Mary is viewed versus both her brother and her much more famous sister is twofold. Firstly, the brevity of Mary's reign makes the burnings seem all the more acute. But secondly, she was the lone Catholic between two Protestant rulers. Catholicism, as the dominant religion of England, never truly regained supremacy. History is written by the victors, and in this context, Protestantism itself was the victor. Even now, a Catholic cannot be in the line of succession to the crown of Great Britain, and until quite recently, anyone in the line of succession who married a Catholic also lost their place. Mary's sex also went against her, for she appeared altogether too dogmatic for the men of 16th century England to accept despite the fact that her sister would reign with as equal strength and power and verve. It is in Elizabeth that Mary is perhaps most unfavourably compared. By the time she ascended to the throne, Mary, as I've said, was considered old by the standards of the time. She made a deeply unpopular marriage and was unfavourably labelled as unfashionable and gruff. Despite this, other contemporary accounts also describe her as being a very kind woman, particularly to those in her service. She was known to play lots of card games. She had a very good sense of humour. But unfortunately, all of this could not entirely counteract the greater attributes which her sister possessed. Her youth, her entirely English blood, and as would be seen, a more pragmatic approach to the religious beliefs of her people. Elizabeth's decision to remain the Virgin Queen, married to her nation, and the strength and stability that her 45-year reign created ensured there was a key distinction in the way we view Queen Mary versus Queen Elizabeth. Even in death, Mary is cheated by history, resting beside her half-sister, but without any of the grandeur that Elizabeth's tomb provides. Mary's presence in this tomb is only seen via a small plaque the rest hidden behind a metal grate. So, now that we have Mary's story, albeit condensed down enormously, I assure you there is so much more to Mary's story, let's dive into the key depictions of her on screen and figure out where and why she has been viewed as such a villain. Mary first appeared in an English-speaking role in the 1936 film Nine Days a Queen, which as the name would suggest, is primarily about Lady Jane Grey. Much like the more well-known private life of Henry VIII, starring Charles Lawton, 
The film is very much a product of its time. Mary's role, played by Dame Gwen Davies, is limited to just a couple of short scenes. After becoming queen, she meets with Jane Grey and immediately tells her that she and her husband, Guilford Dudley, will die. None of the initial clemency that we know Mary was keen to extend to Jane is depicted. Instead, she comes in during the last 15 minutes of the film and sanctions the death of an innocent 16-year-old girl. The very next scene is the execution of Jane Grey, and nothing more of Mary is mentioned. The film takes a very heavy-handed approach in ensuring that we feel nothing but horror at what Jane has to endure, and that Mary is cruel and cold and without great thought. In the 1969 film Anne of the Thousand Days, Mary, played by Nicola Paget, is fleetingly seen just once, at the bedside of her ailing mother, Catherine of Aragon. We know this meeting did not take place. Mary is also shown as having very dark brown hair, as opposed to the chestnut red that we know the real Mary possessed. As Catherine cries out in pain, Mary calls for a doctor, and that's it. Her betrayal is over in a matter of seconds. There's not really much more we can say about that depiction. In 1970, the BBC released the first of its three miniseries focusing on the Tudor dynasty, these being the Six Wives of Henry VIII, Elizabeth R, and the far lesser known, but nonetheless excellent, The Shadow of the Tower, which tells the story of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. Starting with The Six Wives of Henry VIII, the series, as the name suggests, focuses on the many queens of King Henry, with an episode dedicated to each. Despite being the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, Henry's longest marriage by some length, Mary is basically left out of the series. She appears fleetingly in the episode dedicated to her mother, and next appears as a young woman in the Jane Seymour and Catherine Parr episodes. She has little dialogue, and as such, not much more can really be said of the portrayal. One thing I can say, however, is that they got the hair and the overall costuming nailed. The following year, a film adapted from the series was released, although flipped to become Henry VIII and his six wives. The film opens with the king on his deathbed and jumps back in time as he remembers his momentous reign step by step. Naturally, it focuses mostly on the king himself, once again starring Keith Michelle, who had played Henry VIII in the BBC miniseries. If anyone listening has not seen Keith Michelle in either of these productions, then I implore you to track them down, for he gives us, without doubt, the greatest depiction of Henry VIII ever seen on screen. In the film, Mary is given a bit more screen time than the series permitted. She is shown first as a little girl, aged around three, running around throwing leaves in the air, adored by her father and mother. We later see her return to the court and assist with the upbringing of her siblings. Alas, not much dialogue is allotted to her, though there were some unreleased deleted scenes of which you can still see occasional stills online, so it's possible there was more for Mary in the original script. What can be said, again in keeping with other productions of the time, is that significant accuracy was given to the costumes and the casting choices. The actress looks almost exactly like the well-known portrait of Mary in her teens by Master John. It is films like this that prove costuming accuracy is possible. Yes, I'm throwing major shade at you, the Tudors, and even worse, Rain. In 1971, the BBC released its second Tudor miniseries, Elizabeth R., starring the late, great Glenda Jackson in the eponymous role. Again, it was six parts, with each episode covering roughly a decade of Elizabeth's life. The vast majority of the first episode focuses on the relationship between Mary and Elizabeth, making it one of the few depictions of Mary of significant note. Elizabeth R. was met with acclaim, and yet again, for productions of the time, particular accuracy was paid towards the costuming and hair. Mary was played by Daphne Slater, a well-chosen bit of casting, as she possessed a slight frame and piercing grey-blue eyes. It was said in a contemporary description of the real Mary that she had incredibly sharp eyes, which could strike terror in those whom she laid them on. Daphne's hair, albeit a wig, is the correct auburn shade that matched Mary's. In short, Daphne looked the part. Refreshingly, 
much of the episode's airtime is given to Mary, but sadly, the actual depiction is not particularly generous. Mary is shown as weak, feeble, and very jealous of her younger sister, particularly following a moment in which Sir Thomas Wyatt the Younger cries, Long live the Princess Elizabeth, causing outrage from Mary, as heard in this clip. Why am I hated? You are loved. I am merciful. I have spared Lady Jane and her lord. I will spare Cranmer if he recants. I condemn Northumberland with regret. The people support you. They ousted Northumberland for you. The people are glad that I am old enough to die in time for you to become queen. Most unkindly, Mary is shown as being particularly foolish when it comes to her marriage and endures a particularly humiliating wedding night. Mary sits up in bed wearing garish makeup that's almost clown-like. Think whatever happened to baby Jane meets Tudor England. She sits waiting for her beloved husband to join her. When Philip does eventually show up, Mary has fallen asleep with Dribble noticeably falling down her chin. No sooner has Philip met her than he makes it clear how very taken he is with Mary's younger sister, Elizabeth. The husband Mary so craved is only interested in her younger sister, the daughter of her hated stepmother, Anne Boleyn. It is a humiliating depiction. Mary grows ill, despondent, and irascible. Naturally, the episode concludes with her death and Elizabeth's accession to the throne. The shocking part is that, at this point, this depiction is probably the most well-rounded portrayal of Queen Mary, which really highlights the sheer brevity of meaningful representations of her seen on screen. Mary would not be seen again in film and television until 1986 with the release of Lady Jane, about, you guessed it, Lady Jane Grey. Helena Bonham Carter stars in her film debut, playing the leading role of the ill-fated Nine Days Queen, alongside Carrie Elwes as her husband, Lord Guilford Dudley. Mary is played by Jane Lapotere, an incredible actress who was most recently seen as the wonderfully eccentric and adorable Princess Alice of Greece and Denmark, mother to the modern-day Prince Philip, in season three of Netflix's The Crown. Unlike the earlier film about Lady Jane Grey, this performance provides much more for Jane Lapotere to work with, although her screen time is not extensive. We do know, however, that there were a few deleted scenes featuring Mary. One of the most accurate scenes from the film shows Mary riding into the Tower of London on a wave of popular support after overthrowing the rule of Jane Grey and her followers. This is well recorded as having taken place and accurately shows the release of men by Mary imprisoned under her brother's reign. Jane Lapotere is given the chance to regale the spectators of London, telling them, These are my prisoners. Honest men, incarcerated by my brother's officers. But by the grace of God, and in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, they are prisoners no more, as no man shall be, if with honest heart he spurns all heresy. Refreshingly, Mary is also shown as wanting to give clemency to her cousin, Lady Jane, following her removal of the teenage Jane from the throne. Again, we know this is true to fact. Queen Mary I was clear in her view that Jane Grey was an innocent, pushed onto the throne by more powerful forces around her. In the film, a scene which did not happen in real life, at least to the best of our knowledge, shows the two women meeting, with Mary telling Jane... It's not your fault. Perhaps it's showed a want of prudence but you are very young you will both be tried you know in a few months time I think when things have cooled and naturally you will be condemned to death but of course I have the power of reprieve which at present When later in the film it becomes clear that Mary will have to agree to Jane's execution, she is shown expressing genuine sadness, which I think would have been true of the real Mary. They were, after all, related by blood, 
and Jane was a girl of just 16 years old. Another aspect of the film that they get right is the costumes. Yes, I'm talking costumes again. Bear with me, guys. Mary's are particularly sumptuous. They come in colours of royal purple and Catholic red, and greatly resemble many of the portraits that we have of the Queen. They do, however, make for a major contrast when viewed against the simple nature of Jane Grey's attire. The real Jane Grey was said to openly rebuff ostentatious dress, believing it to be frivolous, and was said to favour the more sombre attire of her other royal cousin, Lady Elizabeth, who at this stage at least chose to adopt simpler dress. That Helena Bonham Carter's depiction of Jane is so opposed in dress to Mary is thus not only accurate, but creates a clear distinction between the way the two women convey their power and their understanding of religion. Mary was not seen again in film and television for another 12 years. It was in 1998 that Sherka Kapoor's critically acclaimed film, Elizabeth, was released, catapulting Kate Blanchett in the role of Elizabeth into the Hollywood A-list. A superb film covering the early stages of Elizabeth's reign, it starts with the burnings of Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley and an unnamed female. Latimer and Ridley, alongside Thomas Cranmer, would become the most famous names of those who would endure the flames on Mary's orders. The very opening scene of the film, directly preceding their burning, is a very difficult watch. We see the prisoner's hair being shorn off, with little to no care given to avoid injury. They bleed copiously whilst praying out loud. They are then taken to the stake and executed on the orders of Mary I, screaming in pain, the crowd horrified at what they're witnessing. Mary is played by Cathy Burke, an actress not hugely known outside of the UK, who is nonetheless a national treasure for us Brits. Sadly, however, it is an extremely one-sided portrayal. From the outset, Elizabeth is extraordinarily pro-Elizabeth, and anti-anything Mary, non-English, or Catholic. The film's sequel, Elizabeth the Golden Age, was met with a much more mixed critical response, with some calling it blatantly anti-Catholic. Personally, I would say the earlier film has more of an anti-Catholic agenda at play, but this taken aside, Elizabeth is still an incredibly good film. The first 30 minutes focuses heavily on the relationship between Elizabeth and Mary. A very, very heavy-handed approach is taken to make it clear how we, as the audience, should feel about these two women. Mary's court is dark and deeply foreboding, practically all colour is removed. The imposing architecture and the lack of light is deliberate. We are supposed to not like anything to do with Mary. Everything about her court suggests darkness and cruelty. Even the access point into Mary's chambers is sharp and claustrophobic. Mary herself is shown as bloody, naive and almost mentally ill. She has black teeth, she's sweaty and bloated. Even her husband's body language suggests abhorrence to his wife. Her counsellors encourage her mistrust and jealousy of Elizabeth, goading Mary into proclaiming aloud, My sister was born of that whore, Anne Boleyn. She was born a bastard. She will never rule England. Mary's court is portrayed, quite simply, as evil. It's portrayed as almost cancerous, a blot on English history that should be viewed with nothing but the most disapproving eye. Conversely, our first introduction to Elizabeth is the polar opposite. She is seen dancing in a sunlit field, clad in bright colours, free of worry, surrounded by adoring friends, not sycophants, and clearly deeply loved for who she is, not what she is, by her favourite, Robert Dudley. When arrested by Mary's henchmen, we are immediately made to feel sorry for Elizabeth. When Elizabeth comes face to face with her sister, Mary abandons all pretense of decorum and rants. When I look at you, I see nothing of the king, only that whore, your mother. <laughs> My father never did anything so well as to cut off her head. Your Majesty forgets he was also my father. The sisters then have a wish to relatively... sour the moment Elizabeth confirms that she will act as her conscience dictates when she becomes queen. 
shortly after Mary dies, bloated, sweaty, and frankly, repulsive. Kathy Burke's acting is, of course, superb. Don't come for me, people. I love Kathy Burke. But it is an undoubtedly one sided depiction. And as ever, it is Mary the suffers. I think, on balance, that Elizabeth depicts the very worst representation of Mary. Nothing positive can be said about it. It's good versus bad. It's light versus dark. But life, like Mary's story, would have sat in the grey areas. But in Elizabeth, such considerations are entirely missing. A decade later, Showtime released the first of its four seasons long series, The Tudors. The series tells the story of King Henry VIII and his court, his wives, his friends, his enemies, and his children. I have to admit that I found much of The Tudors almost unwatchable. I found it silly and at times just utterly ludicrous. The inaccuracies for me were just too much to look past and I really felt that it was history dumbed down. There was a lot of overacting and there was a big reliance on sex, although it wasn't nearly as bad as the utterly ridiculous reign which told a very loose version of Mary Queen of Scots life. With all of that said, Mary's character in the Tudors is one of the better things about the show. Mary is finally given a truly starring role. Moreover, it's one that is well-rounded, thoughtful, and with much more significance than either Elizabeth or Edward. In the early stages of season one, we see her as a little girl pushing over the Dauphin of France, much to her father's amusement, and she grows into a vivacious, caring, and dedicated young woman, portrayed wonderfully by Sarah Bolger. She does display flashes of the cruelty that would come to categorise her reign, but broadly this is a much more sympathetic depiction. One of the things that the Tudors really got right was that it highlighted Mary's popularity with the common people, particularly those in the north of England. It also wonderfully conveyed Mary's sense of duty to her father and the realm, as well as her decorum. We see this most plainly when compared against the frivolous behaviour of the king's fifth queen, Catherine Howard. In the episode in which the royal family travel north, Mary has a major starring role in the activity conducted during the visit, and it couldn't be plainer from the looks from her father that he is extremely proud of his daughter, and moreover that he recognises both the love the people have for her and her understanding of the position that she is called to in life again shown favourably against Catherine Howard, who is depicted as bored and stifled by the more weighty responsibilities of being queen. I hasten to add, I think this is a creation of the show. The accounts actually all point to Catherine being a, a dutiful queen, very much aware of what was expected of her. Either way, I rather suspect that this behaviour would have been true of the real Henry and Mary, who despite all of their ups and downs, were, after all, father and daughter. Another thing that the Tudors does well is highlight just how explosive Mary's early life was. From the breakdown of her parents' marriage and the rise of Anne Boleyn, and Mary's unwillingness to acknowledge Anne, are all portrayed with care and consideration. What's great about the Tudors is that it finally gave Mary a platform to exist before the archetypal bloody Mary came along. Although the show itself was not known for its accuracy, it finally gave us a well-rounded portrayal of Mary, not a caricature, but a believable human being. Sarah Bolger's portrayal was also very well received by critics, leading to the Irish-born Bolger becoming the first actress to receive an acting award in a portrayal of Mary, namely that of actress in a supporting role at the Irish Film and Television Awards in 2010. The next notable, albeit fleeting, depiction of Mary came in 2015 in the six-part miniseries Wolf Hall. Universally hailed as one of the greatest historical dramas of all time, Wolf Hall was a six-part masterpiece, which covered the rise of Thomas Cromwell as Henry VIII's chief minister and the role he played in the downfall of Anne Boleyn. Although based on the historically fictional works of the late Dame Hilary Mantel, accuracy given to the production, the writing and the star quality of its leads led to an outpouring of critical acclaim. 
I, for one, am a firm Wolf Hall fan. It's grown up, proper history, and I love it. Mary appears in a supporting role as a teenager standing alongside her ailing mother, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine is played by Joanne Wally, giving Joanne the distinction of being the only actress to play both mother and daughter, albeit in different productions, for she also played Mary in the 2005 miniseries The Virgin Queen, starring Anne-Marie Duff as Elizabeth. In Wolf Hall, the depiction of Mary is not hugely sympathetic, although one does feel very sorry for the young princess, which is something of a step change. The best word to describe Wolf Hall's Mary would be weak. She is shown as sickly, as vacant and timid. She clearly suffers from a gynecological ailment, being overcome with pain and whispering to her mother in Spanish, my woman's disorder. Mary is treated with respect by Sir Mark Rylance's Thomas Cromwell, addressing her as Princess Mary and insisting she sit to alleviate her discomfort. Although not allotted much screen time, the audience is clearly meant to feel sympathy for the young princess, who seems an almost pitiable character. So, I've now reached 2022, and the release of Becoming Elizabeth, a moment I've been excited to discuss since the start of the episode, because Becoming Elizabeth finally gave us the Mary for our ages. If jean vf Bujold is the greatest Anne Boleyn, Keith Michel is the greatest Henry VIII, and Glenda Jackson is the greatest Elizabeth, then Roma Ligari officially takes the crown for the greatest Mary ever seen on screen. As far as I'm concerned, he cannot be touched. Her performance was a masterpiece. Becoming Elizabeth tells the story of the often overlooked period of King Edward VI's reign, and the turbulence that his sisters would endure throughout that time. Although officially called Becoming Elizabeth, with the younger Tudor princess at its core, many historians, myself included, firmly believe that the figure who came out of the series with the greatest impact was Mary. What makes this Mary so spectacular and so special is that no firm line is taken in her characterization. She is portrayed as multifaceted, multi-layered and complex. In short, she is portrayed as human. Characteristically, she is shown as deeply devout and committed to her faith, but is also caring and loving, bursting into tears when it is believed that her brother will die. She is shown as smart, a political animal through and through, constantly outsmarting the men around her and possessing an entirely firm understanding of what ruling England would entail. She is shown to enjoy blood sports and hunting as much as she takes solace in prayer, something that I think would have been true of the real Mary. She is also fiercely loyal to her country, rebuffing in anger the Spanish ambassador for daring to suggest that she required the aid of Spain and the support of his kingdom. It is not what you were willing to risk, sir, but what I am. You wish me to betray my country for the sake of yours. I am no traitor, sir, nor am I a possession of Spain in need of its protection. I am a princess of England and my brother's heir. You would do well to remember that before you next open your mouth to counsel me. I think what I love most about Becoming Elizabeth's portrayal of Mary is that she's viewed as the experienced adult that she would have been. The age difference between her and her two siblings is very clear, with Mary shown as holding the deep love and respect of the English people and the more conservative members of court. She is the living representative of the past and the present in one person, the sole member of the court who has both the grandeur of her birth mixed with the years of experience. Becoming Elizabeth provided Roma Ligari with several moments to shine, but two really stick out. The first is the incredible end of episode four, which contrasts beautifully between Mary holding a Catholic mass and Elizabeth returning to court to pledge fealty to her brother. It's a stunning sequence, perhaps the greatest part of the whole series, for the way that it deftly contrasts the actions of these two sisters. The other scene comes early on in the final episode of the season. Edward VI is gravely ill, and his council, alongside Elizabeth, are gathered in church, praying for a swift recovery. Soon, noise can be heard from outside of the church, the patter of hooves, the cheer of a crowd, 
much to the chagrin of the Duke of Northumberland, who has taken control of the King's Council. It is obvious that the noise can only be as a result of Mary having appeared before the people of London. We then cut to the vast number of attendants in Mary's retinue marching into the capital with Mary at their heart, to the great acclaim of the common people. In an incredibly badass, albeit fictionalised scene, the court, led by Northumberland, then hurry to greet Mary. Princess Mary, we are pleased to receive you, even if under such circumstances. Oh, Dudley, I see you are determined to make amends. <laughs> but perhaps start with actions rather than words. What actions do you wish me to take? Oh, well, now that you ask. I can think of three whilst on my spot. I would like you to release the Bishop Gardner from the tower. I would like to take a Catholic service with my priest to pray for my brother's recovery. And I would like you to get out of my fucking way. The end of the series sees Edward momentarily recover and in that brief period order the banishment of his sisters, for it becomes clear to Edward that whilst his life was in danger, steps were taken to ensure a smooth transition of power with Mary and Edward Seymour at its helm, depriving Northumberland of any real power. When it becomes clear that Edward's respite was just that, a temporary reprieve, Jane Grey appears at court on her father's orders setting in place the process which would eventually lead to her being given the throne on Edward's death. Jane crosses paths with Mary and Elizabeth as they flee from their brother's presence. We see Mary and Elizabeth then have an incredibly frank and thus human exchange, which at its crux raises the question as to whether there was any genuine love between the two sisters. How awful for you to find yourself beside your much-hated sister. I don't hate you. Do you not? No. We love one another, Mary. Do we? Do we really? Or are we so ashamed of what's in our hearts that we try to force love into them? For the truth that hits me again and again is that I have no love for you. Given the later incarceration of Elizabeth on Mary's orders, I rather suspect that although this scene from Becoming Elizabeth was fictitious, that when pressed to reveal the truth, that both sisters would have lacked in true affection for one another, or at least struggled to maintain cordial affinity. Very sadly, Becoming Elizabeth was not picked up for a second season, despite a very warm critical response and the popularity felt by fans of Tudor history. Despite only airing for one season, its greatest legacy is undoubtedly the characterisation of Mary. Finally, a show did well by Mary. It was a perfect depiction, and yes, as it's me, feel it only prudent to make a quick comment on the costumes, which, thank God, were perfection. I would say the best I've seen since the 1972 film Henry VIII and His Six Wives. And so that wraps up the depictions of Queen Mary I on screen. Since the earliest representations forward, Mary, in my opinion, is one of, if not the most unfairly maligned character in British history. The burnings which so characterise her reign undoubtedly leave a bad taste in the mouths of many for good reason, but in her own way Mary genuinely believed that she was doing the right thing. To her and those of her creed, Protestant heretics were a very real problem and she acted decisively to quell their influence. Without wanting to be too controversial, I feel that in a man, her actions would have been viewed as, if not heroic, then at least justifiable. This 500-year hangover has greatly influenced Mary's depictions on screen, helping to solidify her reputation as a cruel and evil woman, entrenching her nickname of Bloody Mary so entirely that it supersedes her own identity. The characterizations of Mary over the years are of course products of their time. Every producer and director, scriptwriter, costume designer, has the right to tell their own version of a story, but Mary's has often felt lazy and formulaic. We see Mary on screen and we see what we're told was the truth, but this has invariably been with an ulterior motive at play, 
be it to represent Lady Jane Grey as a wronged innocent, or position Elizabeth as a tolerant and just ruler, compared to Mary, who is shown as weak, inferior, and cruel. As the world reevaluates much of what we see as par for the course in life, it is natural that old beliefs or representations will change, and for Queen Mary I, 500 years after her death, perhaps now is the most apposite time to reevaluate her story. And so, that brings me to the end of this week's episode of The Tudor Chest, the podcast. I will also be releasing a bonus episode of The Tudor Chest, the podcast, solely for followers of my Patreon account, which explores the lives of Lady Catherine and Lady Mary Grey, and why I believe their stories were as equally tragic as their more famous elder sister, Lady Jane. To access this and other bonus episodes, please head to patreon.com forward slash the Tudor Chest. To keep up to date with all things Tudor Chest, then please follow me on Instagram at the Tudor Chest. Thank you and talk soon. <laughs>